In August 1973, a terrified teenager reported a fatal shooting just outside Houston, Texas. When I got there, walked in and saw the naked body with him shot six times, and saw the floor was covered with plastic sheet, and I knew that this was not just an ordinary shooting. The discovery exposed a series of crimes so vile that even hardened homicide detectives were stunned by the brutality. Everyone was appalled and shocked. It just was unheard of. This was the crime of the century. As well as the police, others also chronicled the investigation on film, on paper, and on tape. Through their lenses, they captured the story of the Candyman. Houston is the largest city in Texas. In the early 1970s, it was a sprawling center of industry and commerce. Some areas of the city, however, had seen better days. One of these was on Houston's northwest side. It was known by its residents as the Heights. At one time, the Heights was a very upper-class socioeconomic area back around the turn of the century. But then by the 70s, there was sort of an economic downturn within the Heights. Many troubled teenagers simply ran away from the problems they encountered at home and at school. Some parents, they would file missing persons reports, they would uh, bug the police, they would look for their children, but those were a minority. The great majority of parents, uh, as I remember it, simply decided that their child had left. At that time, the Houston Police Department did not have a missing persons division. But I do know that there were several teenagers from the Heights area, maybe up to 13, that had been reported missing in the early 70s. On the 29th of May, 1971, Dorothy Hilligeist waved goodbye to her 13-year-old son, David, and his 16-year-old friend, Mally Winkle, as they headed off to a local swimming pool in the Heights. The boys were last seen getting into a van, not far from the Hilligeist home. When they didn't return, their families reported them missing to the police. The techniques police used at the time to search for missing teenagers, runaway juveniles, was contact their friends, uh, contact neighbors, talk to people about whether or not they've seen them, heard any rumors about where they might be, that sort of thing. Well, it was often assumed that if uh, a teenage boy was missing that he was a runaway, or he just decided to, to lay out uh, several nights uh, staying with friends. But despite assurances from the police, Dorothy Hilligeist could not believe that her happy, bright, outgoing son had run away. As the days turned into months, the family combed the Houston area, hired a private detective, and even sought the advice of a psychic. And his mother went around and put up pictures of him and noticed his own utility poles and all kinds of things. Now, he, she really tried to find him. Local friends, including 15-year-old Wayne Henley, helped distribute posters offering a $1,000 reward. But there were no takers. Mally Winkle and David Hilligeist had simply vanished. They were still missing a year later, when 17-year-old Billy Bolsch and his friend Johnny DeLome also disappeared. Billy's brother Michael had a history of running away, so the police assumed Billy had done the same. His parents tried to follow a few leads of their own. They recalled that Billy had often spent time at the home of an electrician with the Houston Light and Power Company, an amiable older man called Dean Coral, known locally as the Candy Man. Dean Coral earned the nickname the Candy Man because his younger days, his family owned a candy company, a small candy company located in the Heights. And he often gave candy away to kids in the neighborhood. Well, most of the people that lived around him in the neighborhood, they said he was a nice guy. 
he'd help them get their car started or, you know, do little things in the neighborhood for people. And they all kind of liked him. Nice, friendly, he was a very good looking man. And he was friends with the kids on the block that would be walking from the elementary school and the junior high school. Sometimes he would take kids on rides in his van. Um, nobody really had anything bad to say about him. Knowing that Billy had once sold sweets for the Carl Company, his family went to Dean for help. Unfortunately, the electrician said he hadn't seen Billy for a while, but promised to call if he did. The Balsh family was still searching for Billy in November 1972, when their 15-year-old son Michael also vanished. In the early morning hours of Wednesday the 8th of August 1973, three teenagers were on their way to Pasadena, Texas, near Houston. Two of the teenagers, 17-year-old Wayne Henley and 15-year-old Rhonda Williams, had been seeing each other since the strange disappearance of Rhonda's boyfriend, Frank Aguirre, more than a year earlier. Since then, more than a dozen teenage boys had gone missing from the Houston area, including three in the last two weeks but no one had connected the disappearances. On this night, Rhonda Williams, Wayne Henley, and his friend Tim Curley had only one thing on their minds. They'd come to Pasadena to party. Rhonda Williams was the girl that Henley had been dating some. She was from a broken home. Didn't have a lot of parental direction. Tim Curley was, I believe, 19 years old at the time and he was just interested in a night of partying where they'd smoke marijuana and sniff glue and whatever they wanted to do. At 3 a.m., the three teenagers entered a house at 2020 Lamar Drive in Pasadena, unaware that soon, partying would be the last thing on their minds. At 3 a.m. on Wednesday, the 8th of August, 1973, three teenagers arrived at a party at 2020 Lamar Drive in Pasadena, Texas. At 8.30 a.m., the Pasadena Police Department received a frantic phone call. I had just come to work in the detective division, and it was on my first cup of coffee, and the lieutenant goad pointed his finger at me and said, come here, you got a shooting, and he handed me the address, 2020 Lamar. When Detective Sergeant David Mulligan arrived on the scene, he found a Pasadena police officer waiting outside with an empty 22 caliber pistol and three suspects. The officer identified them as Houston teenagers Wayne Henley, Rhonda Williams, and Tim Curley. The first officer to respond to the call that morning was a uh, uniform patrolman, uh, Jerry Jameson. He was met by Henley and uh, Curly and Rhonda, they were sitting on the curb out in front of the house. And Henley said, I just killed a man, he's in the house. Age 34, Mulligan had been with the Pasadena Police Department for 12 years. He was about to take on the biggest case of his career. Inside, Mulligan found the naked body of a man lying face down in the hallway outside a small bedroom. His feet were tangled in a telephone cord and there were bloody holes in his back and shoulder. But what the detective found inside the bedroom was even more chilling. Of course, when I got there, I walked in and saw the naked body with uh, him shot six times, looked in the room and saw the floor was covered with plastic sheet and this, what we call a body board, was laying there with handcuffs attached to it, all kinds of sexual objects. Uh, and I knew that this was not just an ordinary shooting. Detective Sergeant Mulligan discovered eight more sets of handcuffs as he searched the house, as well as binding tape, rope, and petroleum jelly. 
in the garage, Mulligan found a van containing a wooden box resembling a small coffin. There were traces of white lime on the garage floor. Mulligan also discovered the identity of the man in the hallway. He was 33-year-old electrician Dean Coral, known in the Heights as the Candyman. At police headquarters, the three teenagers were questioned. They all told essentially the same story. Wayne Henley informed Detective Mulligan that he'd known Dean Coral for several years and that he and many of his friends had spent time with the Candyman in the Heights before Coral's recent move to Pasadena. Wayne Henley was a very bright, street-wise 17-year-old. A school dropout. He lived at home with his mother. Uh, I don't think his father was around much in his teenage years. Coral appeared to be a lot of fun to be around. And he did provide parties that other teenagers went to. So I think the teenagers enjoyed being around him because he was an older man who showed them a lot of fun. On this particular night, Dean Coral had been upset when Wayne Henley had arrived with a girl. But Henley was able to smooth things over and the party was soon underway. Henley and Curly and this girl uh, stayed up all night doing what they called huffing or sniffing glue and paint and whatever they had handy. And they passed out. And when they woke up, Carl had them all handcuffed. The teenagers were shackled hand and foot, and Rhonda and Tim had masking tape over their mouths. Brandishing a knife and gun, Dean Coral vowed to kill them all, but only after he'd had some fun. Henley knew the jig was up, that Carl was getting ready to do him. So he talked to Carl and convinced him to take the handcuffs off and that he would help him do the others. Then they strapped uh, Curly to one side of what they we call a body board, then strapped the girl to the other side and told Henley, you have sex with the girl while I have sex with the boy. I don't have any doubt in my mind that Henley knew that if he didn't do something to Dean Coral right then, that he would he would kill those two. And when he got his hand on a gun is when he started firing and shot Dean Coral dead. Rhonda and Curly's account of the night's events matched Henley's. The shooting seemed to be a simple case of self-defense. Dean Coral's parents had married and divorced twice. Coral had spent most of his early adult years helping his mother with her confectionery business, making sweets at night and working as an electrician during the day. Our investigation into Dean Coral's background uh, indicated that, you know, he was a loner, uh, sort of a nomadic person. He did spend most of his time with teenagers. He moved uh, every few months and uh, had very few acquaintances outside of his employment with people his own age. The investigation found that Dean Coral had often been seen in the company of Wayne Henley and another teenager, 18-year-old David Brooks, also from a broken home. David Brooks was a uh, typical teenager at the time. He lived in the Heights area, smart, streetwise, uh, but a loner, and uh, someone who spent a lot of time on the street. Dean Coral's parents both admitted that their son had seemed very depressed in the days leading up to his death, and had talked about being in some kind of trouble. They also shared their suspicions with the police that his teenage companions might not be as innocent as they seemed. When I got back to the station, I started talking to Henley and Curly and Rhonda. 
And at first, Henley didn't say anything about bodies. And then he started telling me that that was one reason he had killed Carl, because he had a warehouse full of bodies. Back when Henley told me about this, what he called a warehouse, I was pretty skeptical at the time. But Wayne Henley had names to back up his story. They were boys who disappeared from the heights. Jones, Cobble, and Helligeist. And Henley claimed to know how to get to the storage shed full of bodies. When Detective Mulliken checked the story with Houston police, he discovered that teenagers Charles Cobble and Marty Jones had been missing for just over two weeks. Neither fitted the profile of a runaway. Houston police also had a file on David Hilligeist, who had disappeared on his way to a local swimming pool in May 1971. The 8th of August, 1973. In the late afternoon, detectives from Pasadena and Houston police departments arrived at the Southwest Boat Storage Facility in South Houston. It was just a series of sheds made out of metal in which people stored uh, boats or automobiles or all the junk they had assembled and didn't have any use for. Wayne Henley pointed out stall number 11 as the stall where he suspected some bodies were buried. And at that time, we didn't believe him. Even though there were some bizarre things found at the house, we didn't believe that there were multiple bodies buried in this boat shed. The boat shed, however, was locked. So uh, I went to the manager's office and asked uh, who, of course, it was rented to. And she informed me it was Dean Carl. And when we opened the door, Henley turned white as a sheet. And while I was looking at him, I knew the boy was telling the truth. Inside, the police found a dirt floor partly covered by two pieces of carpet. There was a lot of junk and shovels, and uh, there was an old stripped-out car. And there were bicycles, shoes, jackets, and uh, there were some sacks of lime. And there were a number of raised places in the ground that looked like they were freshly dug up. The detectives had brought shovels and inmates from the local jail to help with the digging. Not long after they'd begun, they reached a layer of white powder that they identified as lime. Minutes later, their spades hit something buried six inches below the surface. It was a body wrapped in clear plastic, the same kind of plastic as was found in Dean Coral's bedroom. Then we started scraping the dirt away in a more gentle fashion so we could preserve the bodies. We didn't want cuts and things from the shovels hitting the bodies. It was the naked body of a young boy. A heavy cord was tied tightly around his neck. The story that teenager Wayne Henley had told the police was true. Homicide detectives immediately called a county medical examiner and crime lab investigators to the scene, and they continued to dig. The owner of the storage facility told the police that Dean Coral had been renting the shed for almost two years. She described Coral as a nice man who'd visited the shed two or three times a week and had recently inquired about renting another. News of the discovery soon reached the local media. Of course, there were TV crews and news media all over the place. In fact, I asked uh, one of the TV guys even if I could let Henley use his car phone, call his mom. And that's one of the uh, famous scenes on, on the news. That Henley called his mom on television. Mama, it's Wayne. Mama, I killed Dean. 
the police soon discovered a second body. It was more decomposed than the first, but definitely that of a young person. It was a hot day, and the spell would just knock you over. Everybody was all upset, because they didn't, they didn't ever see anything like it, I don't think. An interview with teenager Wayne Henley made the 10 o'clock news, alerting Houston residents to the distressing discovery. Dean Coral's name was well known in the Heights. The news sent a wave of fear through families whose children had known the Candyman and were now missing. At Houston Homicide, detectives gathered files on teenagers who had disappeared over the past several years. They included almost 50 young people from the Heights alone. The police divided the boat shed floor into sections and began systematically digging their way down. As the night wore on, another body was discovered, then another, and another. It seems like almost every place they dug in there, they found another body. And every time there was a new body found, I would have to run like 200 yards to the nearest telephone and phone in to my office, you know, another body had been found. By midnight, eight bodies had been recovered and sent to the county medical examiner for identification and post-mortem. At the scene, investigators sifted through the soil for evidence. When we started diagramming the uh, different locations, some of them were three deep. There'd be a body and dirt and a body and dirt and a body on top of each other. The search was not over yet. In the light of the following day, the case would take a turn that no one, not even seasoned detectives, could have anticipated. We like to think of ourselves as big, tough guys and experienced men at this. We were all just absolutely in shock. This was the crime of the century. Uh, people uh, just didn't realize that other human beings could do what uh, Dean Carl did to these kids. Thursday, the 9th of August, 1973. The discovery of eight bodies buried in a Houston storage shed was headline news across the United States and around the world. At the center of the story was 33-year-old electrician Dean Coral, whom police now believed was behind the disappearance of many teenage boys from the area of Houston known as the Heights. The newspaper reports I have read from that time are pretty detailed, um, to the point that you knew that there was some kind of sexual abuse going on with these individuals. And even parents as far away as Austin were being very careful where their teenage boys went um, at night after this all hit the news because it was quite terrifying. The hero of the hour was teenager Wayne Henley, who'd led the police to the storage shed and prevented Coral from adding his friends Rhonda Williams and Tim Curley to the list of victims. Uh, there's no doubt about the fact that at the time Henley killed Coral that under the law he was acting in self-defense and defense of third persons, that being Rhonda and Tim. But with eight bodies already uncovered and the search for more continuing, Detective Sergeant David Mullican couldn't believe Dean Coral had acted alone. Mullican had a few more questions for Wayne Henley, still in custody at the Pasadena police station. We established a pretty good rapport. And I treated him right, you know. He uh, was appreciative of that. He was pretty honest with me. Henley was so honest that it soon became clear that his connection to the case was not coincidental. He knew the names of some of the victims because he'd been present when they'd first come in contact with the Candyman. When we uncovered the first one, and uh, Henley said, that's Dramala. Then uh, I knew that he had, you know, played a significant role and uh, that uh, we were going to find what he said was there. 
Wayne Henley's relationship with Dean Carl was that Dean Carl was a Svengali to him. Uh, uh, I think Carl had a great deal of influence over his life and began to cultivate that relationship with him when he was very young, about 14. Henley's relationship uh, with Carl was that of a procurer. He procured young males for Carl to have sex with uh, on the streets of the Heights and wherever he could find them. He lured them to the house uh, under the pretense that, uh, you know, he had some marijuana or he had some uh, other type of drugs to use and uh, or they were going to have a party. Uh, and that's the way he enticed those boys to come to Dean Carl's house. Henley claimed, however, that he'd taken no part in the sexual abuse, torture, and murder of any of the victims, although he admitted he'd sometimes been there when it had happened. But another eyewitness was telling a very different story. Earlier that morning, building contractor Alton Brooks had arrived at Houston Homicide. With him was his 18-year-old son, David, with information that was about to change the whole case. David Brooks admitted helping Wayne Henley procure local teenagers for Dean Coral. He assured the police that he had had nothing to do with the killings, but claimed that the same could not be said for Wayne Henley. Henley had not mentioned Brooks until that time. And that, when I told him that, he said, well, that's good, because now I can tell you the whole story. Well, at first, he was upset because uh, he was informed that David Brooks had denied any involvement in anything. And uh, so we uh, took Wayne Henley to the Houston Police Department, and, and he was given the opportunity to speak directly to David Brooks uh, and urge David Brooks to tell the truth. Meanwhile, under the watchful eye of the media, the police uncovered nine more bodies in the boat shed, bringing the total to 17. Some of the bodies were identified that afternoon by County Medical Examiner Joe Yahimshik. Teenage brothers Donald and Jerry Waldrop were identified from descriptions of clothing provided by their family. They did go quite heavily on personal effects at that time. There are many of these boys that had had um, dental exams and dental x-rays. So the ones who were identified first tended to be the ones that were better preserved. Many more families contacted the Houston and Pasadena police about their lost children, searching for answers, but fearful of what those answers could mean. The poor parents I talked to, I, I, would, I, I can't describe anything other than shock that it was one of their children that had been tortured, perhaps sexually abused, and uh, murdered and buried in a plastic sheet. This is before Gacy in Chicago. Uh, nothing like this had ever really happened. Uh, a series of serial killings, this many bodies. David Brooks said he had known Dean Carl since he was 14 and had lived with him at several of his residences in the Heights. He also admitted to taking part in Carl's sadistic rituals. David Brooks never alluded to a sexual relationship between the two of them. However, I think that he was uh, uh, the one who would solicit these young boys to uh, would befriend them to associate with Dean Coral, whose motive we well know was uh, sex, torture, and, and, and eventually killing. It was David Brooks who'd introduced Wayne Henley to Coral late in 1971. Uh, and he may at one time have been a potential victim, uh, but for some reason, uh, Coral liked him. And he uh, agreed to engage in similar activity, procurement activity, with David Brooks. 
and so he was spared. Carl promised Henley $200 to every boy he would bring, and so it turned into a semi-business relationship. They used what they call a handcuff trick on a lot of them. Henley would put handcuffs on, and then he'd have a key in his back pocket, and he'd let himself out of the cuffs. Then they'd tell the kid, you know, you try this. Of course, he didn't have a key, so then they'd take him down. Both boys related terrible stories of the abuse and cruelty inflicted by Dean Carl. He would lay down a sheet of plastic and put the board on top of it, and then he'd have his fun with his victims. And then after he'd kill them, they'd just wrap them up in that plastic. So nothing was ever uh, got onto the carpet or anything. They'd wrap them in plastic, put them in a body box, take them to where they were going to bury them. David Brooks swore he'd never killed anyone. In fact, he claimed he'd saved one young man, called Billy Ridinger, by persuading Coral to let him go. But he admitted to being present during some of the murders and named some of the victims, including Billy Bolsh and Johnny DeLone. Once David Brooks started talking, he was almost like a machine. Dude, it was like a uh, monotone. There was no passion, it was just a recitation of events. It was very eerie. While he denied taking part in the torture, Wayne Henley now acknowledged his direct involvement in some of the murders. In fact, he told about one of the murders, how he had committed it, took the gun and put it in the guy's mouth while he was sitting there tied up. And then he put, pulled the trigger. It was one of his classmates at school. I was shocked at how many specific names both Henley and Brooks were able to remember the order in which they were killed and where they were buried. Uh, they didn't miss much. There were more bodies to come. Later that Thursday afternoon, Wayne Henley led detectives to a wooded area not far from Lake Sam Rayburn, 240 kilometers northeast of Houston. Henley, when he could tell us exactly where to go, we drove down this little dirt road for a while, and he said, "Stop right here. There's two bodies here." And we went out, and sure enough, there were two there. The next morning, we went back out to the woods, and he showed us where the two other bodies were. Three of the victims had been strangled. The cords were still tight around their necks. The fourth was bound by a hangman's noose. All four bodies bore signs of torture and mutilation. Later on Friday, the 10th of August, 1973, Brooks and Henley led police to a third site near the tiny beach community of High Island, 130 kilometers south of Houston. A media convoy followed as they walked the beach, pointing out places where bodies were buried. And this is a huge sand pile down there along the beach where it's come in. And Brooks was looking over his head with all these deputies around him. I said, by God, this a chance to get them together. I never thought I'd ever get a picture of them together. Yeah, I shot. They're 17 and 18 years old, and they've just really stepped into what's going to govern the rest of their lives, and you can see it in their faces. And I look at the waste, not only of their lives, but of all these young lives, and that picture comes back to me. Wayne Henley and David Brooks led the police to six more burial sites on High Island, bringing the body count to a possible 27. I wouldn't have been surprised if there were a thousand bodies. I mean, the story was just that big and uh, and who knows how long they've been going on. 
that was a question only one man could answer. And on that same Friday, while the bodies of young boys were being retrieved from the beaches of High Island, Dean Coral, the candy man, was laid to rest, taking his dark secrets to the grave. Monday, the 13th of August, 1973. In Houston, Texas, a grand jury was convened to hear witnesses in a serial murder case that had shocked the world. The focus was on Wayne Henley and David Brooks. The young men had led the police to the bodies of 27 teenagers who'd been brutally murdered over a three-year period. They both admitted to having been involved in the killings. The public reaction was particularly strong in the Heights, the Houston neighborhood where 18 of the victims had lived and died. The community was very um, upset that something like that might not have been investigated well. I do know that the father of one of the sets of brothers uh, was very vocal at the time about things that could maybe have been done to prevent his son's death. We had two sets of brothers, which must have been very difficult for the families. Um, so hard to lose one son, but to lose two in these circumstances must have been terrible. It was difficult to comprehend the power that Dean Coral seemed to have had over his teenage accomplices. I think Dean Coral was more of a Svengali to both David Brooks and Wayne Henley. He uh, had a great deal of influence over them. Both of them fairly smart, streetwise kids, but they were immature, very young. When they fell under the influence of Dean Carl, he was a real bad guy in this case. I don't think either one of them, one of them would have engaged in this type of activity on their own. I think some of their acts were done in fear of what might happen to them. But as time went on, I think Wayne Henley got involved in it. It was a power thing with him. He had the power over life and death. And he might have got addicted a little bit to that. Wayne was, and I suspect is, a very intelligent man who was uh, done in by his upbringing. He had an abusive father. He had a weak mother. Uh, he dropped out of school uh, at an early age. He uh, embarked in a, in a dissolute life. And I suspect that Carl was the father that he never had and led him into uh, uh, a terrible life. Whatever the reason, Henley had been willing to sacrifice the lives of his friends and schoolmates. Both Tim Curley and Henley's girlfriend, Rhonda Williams, gave evidence at the hearing on the 13th of August, reliving their terrifying experiences on August the 8th. It was clear to witnesses at the hearing that on the night he'd shot Dean Coral, Wayne Henley had intended to offer Tim Curley as Coral's next victim. A young man called Billy Ridinger also gave evidence, admitting that he too had experienced Dean Carl's sadistic cravings. In 73, when we dug up all the bodies, it had been about two years since Ridinger's incident. He was the only known survivor that had ever gone in there and lived to tell about it. By October 1973, all but six of the bodies had been positively identified. The police stopped searching for further victims at the end of September, despite rumors of bodies buried elsewhere. We were not able to get any information or any evidence to indicate there were any more than 27 victims, because 27 was all that Wayne Henley and David Brooks knew about. But it's quite possible in fact, it may be probable that there were others that they did not know about. In 1974, 
David Brooks pleaded guilty to one count of murder for the death of teenager Billy Lawrence. Well, the evidence against Brooks was the fact that he gave a confession. That was number one. And his uh, association with Henley and uh, Dean Carl, and he admitted to being there when some of the murders were committed, so it didn't take a lot. Elmer Wayne Henley's trial was a media circus. The only thing I can equate it to was his O.J. Simpson trial without the television in the courtroom. The trial itself was pretty much an anticlimactic situation as far as making news with. I mean, the facts were there. Uh, the defense was essentially trying to paddle up Niagara Falls, which was impossible. And he was summarily convicted. Wayne Henley was sentenced to six concurrent 99-year terms, while David Brooks received one 99-year term. In 1994, the Harris County Medical Examiner's Office made a breakthrough with a combination of art and science known as forensic 